now. How you doing, Mr. Gaucher? I'm doing really well. I'm hanging out with the great Will Terry. <laughs> I'm hanging out with the great Mr. Tyrus Gaucher. And this video is going to be called, Can You Overcharge for Your Illustration Work? And uh, I, I'm going to do a little bit of housekeeping here before we get going on this topic. Um, one of the reasons why I wanted to, to bring you in on this is because I think a lot of times I, like I said to you before, I push my opinions out there, but there's nobody to check them, right? Right. So yeah. you're, the, you're, the, you're, the, you're the one that's supposed to <laughs> disagree. Oh, yeah. I'll, I'll see what I can do. But look, if we agree, you know, I, we just end up agreeing and we have that's to leave right. it at that. So that's boring. Okay, um, so this is the podcast where we talk and you draw. I always like to to give people permission to draw like like they need it, right? Um, we're also going to tackle uh, another subject that I felt kind of fit in with this, but you can't make a title with like too many subjects. But that one is uh, how to turn down work because I I think that there's uh, good good and bad ways to turn down work. Um, and then just to answer a few questions that I've been getting on, on the, uh, the videos lately is a lot, a lot of people have been asking me like, Will, why did you do this Kickstarter? Why did you do this, all these, these fan art pieces when you could be doing children's books, you could be doing all this other freelance and stuff like that. And the, the truth of it is I'm in a really good place right now. I get asked to do freelance, not every week. I used to get asked every week, but now it's like, it comes in sporadically. Um, some are really good jobs. Some are not. Um, some are offers that are children's books that I don't want to do for because this, maybe the story is not good um, or the story is something that I don't care about. I don't feel the passion for. Um, but I really felt passionate about this this um, this Kickstarter. And if you haven't seen that, you can I'll put a link to it below. It's already ended. And by the way, it did it totally funded. It funded for just a little over forty thousand dollars. And, um, but I wanted to do that because it's just so much fun. And I'm in a place right now in my life where I can, I can choose to do the things that I want more than the things that I have to do, which is a, basically a dream come true. Um, and so that's kind of the reason for doing that. I think, I think a lot of people were puzzled. Another reason why I didn't do a follow-up video on the Kickstarter video, because I was making kind of a playlist out of those is I looked at my views and apparently people don't really care about the Kickstarter. Like I was, you know, with Mel, you know, Mel, right? Right. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So I was doing these, uh, you know, he and I launched our Kickstarters about the same time. And, uh, I was doing kind of like, you know, our thought process and kind of strategies and stuff like that. I noticed the views really kind of took a dip. So that just tells me a lot of you guys could care less about my Kickstarter, which is fine. It's just, it's kind of interesting though. You know, when you, when you do a YouTube channel, like there's no, as far as I know, there's no manual on like how to do a YouTube channel. I just kind of basically make videos that I think are interesting subjects that would be interesting to me. And I'm hoping that they're interesting to other people. Um, and then, so there's that. So Kickstarter wrapped up. I'm going to be finishing the last uh, characters and, and shipping those out in August, September around there. And, um, and then another question I get, I always see like, there'll be people in the comments that'll go, will you tend to ramble? <laughs> like your videos go way too long. And then other people are like, no, I love the long ones. Cause I like to draw. So just for those of you who, you know, think we could get to the cut to the chase a little quicker. That's not what this channel is all about. This is about wasting time so that you can keep drawing. Right. We, we're burning the midnight oil so that you can too, right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, though, it's about process, right? And so yeah. we're not trying to get to quick answers or end it in five minutes. The, the point right. is, is sometimes we're solving problems or you're solving problems while you're talking, you're figuring it out. So you'll put the problem out there and then suggest answers. So that's not something that happens immediately if it's done well. It's brainstorming. And it's the same way with art. You don't yeah. sit down and draw a masterpiece in five minutes. That masterpiece may take you five years or five months, but I promise you it won't be five minutes. And it's the process. It's failing, uh, trying again, retrying another idea. And so that's what we do, or that's what you do on your show, and that's what I would do on my show. I would yeah. talk about things and talk it through, and that's how artists' brains work. So it's you not know, always quick and perfect. Sometimes I make discoveries as I'm 
trying to think it through and, and formulate the words. So there's a lot of, like you mentioned, there's a lot of videos out there that are five minutes and they're like, how to do this, how to paint this in Photoshop, how to do this thing. That's, and those are good when you're looking for something really quick and you want to learn how to do something. The, this is more, uh, you know, there's going to be more nuance to this conversation. So rather than just say, because the other thing is, I think when you're doing something that's opinion, if you do it quickly, my fear is that someone doesn't understand the nuance and then they take your advice and then they don't like what the results. And then I've actually had blowback where people are like, you said this, you know, and <laughs> that's why I have to be very careful to explain my feelings, uh, you know, cause there is a lot of different sides to it and different ways to look at it and different ways to approach it. And, and I, you know me, I'm not one of those people that thinks there's a right and wrong answer to everything. There's, there's lots of right and wrong answers. You, know? you have to, at the beginning of your video, put a surgeon warning on like a pack of cigarettes. <laughs> so people won't say, you ruined my life, Will Terry. <laughs> you say, no, no, no. Didn't you read the message at the beginning of the video? I'm not qualified to tell anybody what to do with their life ever. <laughs> exactly. So, okay. So, um, all right. So let's see that. And then I think that's it. So let's talk about you for a second. So we met on Facebook and you're an illustrator and slash game designer slash MMA fighter slash Marine <laughs> slash, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Family man. Yeah. Yeah. All of that uh, nerd stuff. You like, yeah. you like barbecue and stuff too, don't you? I do love barbecue. I'm against veganism, vegetarianism <laughs> and everything else that removes meat. Uh, I sometimes bite random people. Why? Because they're meaty. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, I, I don't, I'm just an artist, man. And um, it, I find something weird. I was just thinking about this earlier today, completely off topic. But when, an, when someone turns down work because it's not what they do. So I was hiring artists to work on these projects with me. And oftentimes artists, they'll say, well, that's not what I do. I don't, I don't understand it. I do anything that makes me money that I enjoy. <laughs> so if it's 3D, if it's 2D, if it's animation, if it's a you know, children's book, if it's a video right. game, if I think it's cool, I'm going to learn how to do it and I'm going to try to do it well. And then, you know, at the end of the project or whatever, the process, I may say, hey, I'm not really into this, right? Uh, last summer, I dealt with uh, sculpting for 3D, doing some stuff for Gatorade. And uh, it was tough. It was not as, but I, hey, you know, you do it. You figure it out, you like it, you hate it, you do what you got to do and you move on. I find it so so weird when artists are like, no, I only do one thing. Well, I, I guess some people work that way. But for me, I try to touch a little bit of everything and uh, whatever pans out, pans out. So in the last couple of years, I've just been doing children's books and video games, right? Mm -hmm. And I like it, you know, but in two years, I might be doing virtual reality art and only that. I don't know. So I love that. I love that mindset because you've allowed yourself to go in different directions. And uh, I mean, where I, when I came out of school, we were taught basically you focus on one thing and you just go down that road and that's the only thing you do. And it was really hard for me to give myself permission to, to work on other things. Um, but I think that's where you grow and you learn the most. And I, I think that's a great attitude. Yeah. I'm pretty much an assassin for hire. So, <laughs> you know, I get a call, <laughs> they want something killed. I volunteer, tell them a price, and then I get to it. I mean, it is what it is. You know, you never know the terrain. You never know what's going to happen. But as an artist, isn't that the journey? So when we go back and we look at artists, uh, oftentimes they did different things, different mediums because they got bored or they wanted to try something different. And that's how, I don't know, that's how you stay alive as an artist and you don't just become like the shell of what an artist used to be. Uh, it's, it, it is a process and it's learning new things and trying new things and it doesn't always work out. You know, every project isn't going to be a home run, uh, but it's the, it's the journey really. That's what we're excited about as an artist is the journey. So like, well, if you only did books, every book is a different book. It's a different style. Oh yeah. Uh, yeah. It's a different process. It's a different story. So even if you do books, it changes from book to book. A different and problem solving on each one. Absolutely. What you learned in the last book may help you a little bit, but you're going to have a brand new problem. You're going to have a brand new look that you need to come up with or a brand new idea that you're trying to exercise. So, you know, it, it baffles me when artists are like, no, 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 only do this. Or I, I guess you could do that. And I'm, I'm sure people make a living and they're happy doing that. But for me, my approach is, yeah, I can do that. Or I can at least try. Or I can at least learn to do it. And then I, I tackle that and spend 
three or four weeks without sleep and uh, constant diet of Red Bull. I keep an emergency case right behind me. It's the emergency <laughs> Red Bull. And then I have the emergency five hour energy stack on the shelf. And, uh, you know, the life of a savage. I'm an art savage slash Ronin slash assassin. That's how you should have introduced me. Uh, Will Terry, if you want to do it the right way. <laughs> I love it. Um, so you're, you've been, uh, you live in the Chicago area, right? I do. So I do. you, you can get work, you get work anywhere, right? I mean, it can come from anywhere. Uh, yeah, I, I don't very often get work from Chicago. Um, yeah. not often at all. My, my clients are all over the country. Um, you know, so no, it, it's not a uh, localized or regional even it's uh random from anywhere. Sometimes Canada, uh, got a client I'm working on a book in Canada right now. Florida, uh, where else am I? New York, New Jersey. Wow. I get a lot of people from Jersey. Shout out to Jersey. All my <laughs> friends out there in Jersey. Um, it random. Doesn't, just, doesn't point, point Pusher live out there? Uh, Dan. Dan yeah. is in New York now. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Hi, Dan. Yeah. Hi, <laughs> Dan. <laughs> point Pusher. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So let's get to our title question. Um, because now that we've we've driven all the people that want five minute videos completely crazy, <laughs> and they're trying to fast forward to this point or back up to it, um, can you? Let me ask you: Can you overcharge for illustration work? Because I hear this all the time. For the five minute people, I'm going to get to the answer very quickly. No, there's no, <laughs> there's, there's I, I don't believe there's a such thing as overcharging. I think um, to simplify it you know what your worth is and what you think the amount of work you're going to put in into the project or what it's worth. And so you have to give that number. I don't think that anyone other than the artist is qualified to say what their art is worth. Now mm -hmm. I may look at your work, Will, and say, uh, just, just plain devil's advocate. Will charges $20,000 for three paintings, right? Mm -hmm. I can say I wouldn't pay $20,000 for three paintings from Will Terry, mm -hmm. right? In the same breath, I would say, I pay $40,000 for a painting from Will Terry, just one. So your price is governed by what you think your, worth, your, your, your work is worth. And how can someone say, well, it's not worth that? I mean, yeah. So where do you think, where do you think that comes from? Because I totally agree. And we, we talked about this just a little bit before we started. But, um, you know, I'll, I'll hear, you know, I'll see a discussion on Facebook. That's where a lot of... My, my, a lot of your uh, pain comes from well, Facebook. <laughs> a lot of my feelers out there come from Twitter and Facebook where I'll see discussions and uh, sometimes I'll just lurk and, 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 you know, not really get involved and other, you know, and sometimes I'll see people that I really respect and they'll, they really, and I really disagree with them. And rather than call them out online, um, I just kind of listen and, you know, and, and again, I don't think that, um, on this one, it's funny. I mean, you, you and I are opinionated, right? I mean, a little bit, a little <laughs> bit, Will Terry, sometimes. So, on this one, I feel like I'm right, but I, I have to leave room for the fact that someone else could come in with a really good argument that could make me go. I have to leave room for that to say, you know, hmm, that you make a really good point. I haven't heard one yet that I really like. Here's why I don't think there's any room for it because art is subjective, right? That's, and that's exactly right. Yeah. And and that statement alone means that price can be determined by who's ever looking at it. It's like if I take a big, huge canvas, let's say 30 by 70 and it's all white and I take and put a blue dot in the center of it. And I say, this is $20 million. How can someone tell me that that's not worth $20 million? Now they can say, I'm not willing to pay $20 million for that. Totally understand and respect that. I don't have any problem with it, but I don't know. So okay, let me let me put it this way. Sometimes I've heard, or I've been given, I've had emails sent to me or messages say, saying my client says I'm overcharging them because I asked for this amount. What do you think? They'll ask me. Mm -hmm. So what would you say to someone who, when their client says you're overcharging them? Um, well, I get those emails. So someone may come to me and say, Hey, can you help me with a book? And I say, well, I'm busy right now. My schedule's booked up until six months. But I said, but if you want help looking for an artist, 
let me know, send me an email and we'll look at the work and I'll tell you if I think this person works for what you're talking about, right? Mm -hmm. And then they'll say, well, this person is saying, this is how much it'll be. And I, my response is, I wouldn't pay that much for that type of art, but, mm -hmm. or I think that's a good deal. But at the end of the day, it's up to the person who's spending the money. Yeah. I mean, yeah. that's always going to be the answer, no matter what. I'm sure someone will come in with a very valid, quote unquote, valid argument. But at the end of the day, it's subjective. So there is no price point that should be put on a wall and say, okay, uh, if you do a 20 page book, it is $19,000, right? Right. You can't do that because let's say that we were to bring Norman Rockwell back from the grave and, <laughs> and he's going to paint a 19 page book, uh, a 20 page book. You're not going to pay him $1,900. It's not going to happen. You know, that's a whole different price range based on what he's worth, based on his style, his appeal, and the audience he attracts. Right. So if you want to say we want to value it on that, maybe. But then you may find a young artist who doesn't have an audience yet, but the style is so captivating. You can see how that person will have an audience. And you can say, this guy, I think he's worth what he's asking. Or you could do flip the coin and say, well, you don't have a large following. Therefore, I think you're only worth. It's so subjective, but yeah. I don't think you can overprice your, as an artist. I don't think, because if, if, let's say, let's say that we say, okay, yes, you can overprice your work. Well, the people who are paying are always going to choose the lowest price possible. They're always going to say, I think you should take this amount because I think it's worth that. And that's such a great point because, because there's, and this is, this is an argument that I would use. Is, I think it's going down the road where you're already going down is, is the client's going to choose the low price, like you said. And because there's a glut of illustrators that are all vying for the same job, mm -hmm. that means we're all going to, over time, undercut each other, undercut each other, undercut each other until the going rate is, in, well, and if you look at sites like Guru. Fiverr. Fiverr. <laughs> <laughs> That's what's happening, right? Yeah. 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 So there's um and and i think some of the questions that i've gotten are from people who spend a lot of time bidding on those sites and mm -hmm. and that that's where they've gotten that idea of well this is the going rate and it is for that community there there has been a going rate set by yeah. that little uh microcosm mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but i would say i would argue that physical labor and emotional labor are completely different things. So, you know, if a plumber comes to my house, in fact, we left the hose attached during the winter. Like, and if like pipe froze hours, and broke, huh? And it froze inside. We had water in the basement last week. And so I mm -hmm. had a plumber come over and he took out, you know, he gave me an estimate. It's going to be $240. And I kept, I actually have the piece right down here. I kept the pipe so I could show my family. So I could say, this is what happens when we leave. We shut off the water in the wintertime. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And facts. And, but the thing is, we had a pipe burst when we first moved in this house on the, in the back of the house, the same exact job. And that plumber charged me $260. So it was $20 cheaper from a totally different plumber this, this last week. Um, and they operate on going rates. They basically, you know, if someone was to charge like say four or 500 bucks in the community of plumbers, they would say, oh, you got ripped off. And they would all agree, right? Mm -hmm. They would all say, no, that's way above the going rate. And mm -hmm. for those of you, let me just also mention this, that I'm going to link my how to price your illustration work video because this is, we're kind of touching on the same thing. So I, have, I already did a whole video on, on this very subject. But yeah, so to go along with it, it we're doing emotional work, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, Very, work is, very emotional. Very and your work, like you, like you were saying to me, you know, what I'm going to do is going to be different from what you're going to do. I'm, it might take me longer to think of the idea for the illustration. You might, you might uh, look at the job and you might see the, the story or whatever and go, Oh, I know exactly what to do. And you just solved it in your mind. And so when you make your bid, it's, it might be lower just for the fact that you know you can satisfy this assignment really well. Whereas I look at it and I might go, gosh, I don't even know what I would do. And I might factor that into my price and say, well, I'm going to have to charge more just because this might take longer to think about, you know? 
Yeah, no, you, you hit it right on the head. Even when you talked about the plumbers, the reason why they would say a union and they would have a set price is because they know the work that has to be done. So you right. come in, you saw the pipe off, you solder a new pipe, the pipe costs exactly eight seventy five. They know the price, right? right? Unless inflation happens, but they still they leave room for that. And they said this should take you approximately an hour and a half to do, right? So there's a set price. So they would say, hey, it'll be two sixty, two forty. 220, but it's all going to be close. Uh, if someone came in and said it'll be $400, they would say, yeah, you got ripped off. Well, now here's the, different with, the difference in, in that in art. With art, you may be able to finish a page in a day. What if it takes me three weeks to finish a page? Uh, because I'm using a completely different technique. Yeah. Um, I also want to check with you on every single thing. I need to send it to you, have, you, have the client approve it, come back, make the changes immediately, where you may say, well, I don't really give revisions. You know, I hit home runs on every sheet. So it's there's a lot of things that, that go into how you work versus how I work or any artist. Therefore, for someone to say this should be the going rate for this, well, I don't know. When I when I illustrate for Disney, I can see them giving me a set price. They're saying, I deal with a community of artists. You know, my boss, he would say, I deal with a community of artists. And this is the going rate we offer for a project like this. Mm -hmm. Now, mm -hmm. here's what I could say that's too low for me, or this is great, or this is really high, mm -hmm. right? I get to then say what I'm worth. I still get to make the final decision. That person is saying, here's what I'm willing to pay you for it. And then I have to make a decision whether it's worth it or not, right? You know, so, but at the same time, they're not telling me officially what I'm worth or what my art is worth. They're saying, here's right. what we're willing to pay you. And for I'm it. really glad that you brought that up because that's a, that's a really important part of this discussion is sometimes I think we're talking about two different things. Sometimes you're asked to give a price and sometimes what you what you just mentioned is you're given a price mm -hmm. where you have to take it or leave it basically. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so they're two very different things. So the first thing that we're talking about is when you're tasked with coming up with the price out of thin air, right? And you have to, your client says, how much would you charge me to do this work? And I think that's where people are are talking about the, um, are, can, you know, can you overcharge someone in that situation? Um, now, when someone like what you mentioned is offering you money, could they underpay you? <laughs> could they? Absolutely. <laughs> right. Every opportunity they get. Right. So if someone can, if someone can underpay you uh, just by offering you that low amount of money, that's your, I mean, at that point you have the decision on what your time is worth. So you right. have to you have to fig, you have to factor that in, um, and and try to figure out you know um, how much time is going to take, and that's really where the experience comes in. Mm -hmm. I you know a lot of a lot of people will say um, they'll tr they'll try to use the pricing book, and you know I in my last video I really I really nailed that certain organization that has that certain book that tells you how to price uh, your illustrations, and I. And I don't mention them by name because they're lawyers and they tend to sue people. I think it's called the Devil's Bible. <laughs> it's something like that. <laughs> but anyway, continue. We'll continue, continue. Yeah, no, but no, really, they they've sued uh, some some prominent illustrators uh, for slander just for talking about them because they're lawyers and they have. When you're in a lawyer, when you're an attorney, you don't have to hire an attorney, so it doesn't cost you anything except right. your time yeah. to ruin someone else's life. But. Mm -hmm. uh, the reason why I don't like that book is because it gives you set prices and it doesn't take into consideration any of the things we've already been talking about. So well, you said something that was really important. And I think even when artists are pricing themselves, right, the emotional part, there's no room for that. And, and when I let's talk about what that means. I think that's important that we explain. There is, wow, I think I did a really good job. I send this over to the client and the client wants everything done over in a whole brand new, completely different way. Right. Well, emotionally, that takes a toll on you. You thought you were done. You, you've given your last sigh, and now you have to start all over again. And you don't say no because in the contract you said three revisions. To you, this is a successful illustrated page, but to them, they don't like it. Yeah. That that takes a toll on you as a human being. Hey, well, there's a reason why Will Terry has that gray beard, right? <laughs> there's a it's reason true. why all of a sudden I'm getting a gray beard, right? <laughs> Uh, you know, it's a it's a it's an emotional toll. It's a beat down, and then you have to wake up in the morning and say, "I'm ready to start all over again and get it right." Yeah. That's a lot, man. That you know.
that's that that unspoken pain uh, of being an artist or a writer or anything that's creative, the rejection part. And it is, it's a big part. It's 50% of what we do. Um, yeah. and so how, how do you price for that? Well, Each person. And that's go a ahead. good point because that, that's one of the things that I would, I would try to take into consideration is do I know this client? Have I worked for them before? Were they a pain in the butt? Yeah. If they were, guess what's happened to the price, baby. It's got to go up. It's got to go up because the, the hassle factor, you've got mm -hmm. to factor that in. So again, dealing with the, you know, the going rate, are you overcharged? Hey, yeah, I'm going to overcharge you if you're going to be hard to work with. AKA, I really don't want to work with you. And I hope you say no and walk away anyway. Yeah. yeah. Let's be honest. That's what it is. It's like, yeah, if I have to work with you, I'm going to give you a nosebleed financially. And if you say no, okay. That's right. So I had one other in case for those people who aren't convinced, because sometimes I I'll leave something out that I want to mention. And then in the comments, I'll see somebody and I'm like, I should have talked about that because they're like, yeah, but what about this? So for those people who aren't convinced, I thought of another analogy, right? To make you can just to seal the deal, to convince you that you actually don't believe there's a going rate. These are for the naysayers. Okay. So I would ask that person, pretend there's someone here that's arguing for this, you know, for this, this, uh, you, that you can actually overcharge someone. Yeah, let's say, pretend. Oh, yeah, pretend. I would say, you know, do you have a car or a, a really nice phone or a really nice fill in the blank something that you really like? And if so, right now, is that car or that phone or that really nice thing for sale? Oh, it's not for sale? You like your car, you like your phone, you like it is for sale. Because what if I have double? What's it, let's say your car's worth ten thousand dollars, and I offer you twenty for it. You're gonna turn it down. And some people would say yes. I you know I will love this car. Okay, fifty thousand dollars. You just overcharged me. If if you say yes, right, mm -hmm. then someone else would say, well, you got ripped off. That car blue get, books at ten thousand. Yeah. That car blue books for 10,000 and you can pick it up for eight. You just overcharged me. So we all do that at all, all times. And if, and if, and if you ever turn down a piece of work because you don't want to do it, you're in a sense in that same mindset, right? That you're, you're in that sense of the only reason you're turning it down is because maybe you don't want to overcharge them, but you would. In other words, if you did trade your time, you would have to overcharge them in order to take that job. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you know, listen, the reality is, is if you didn't take that job, your time would be used for something else, which would be making right. you money. I mean, this is what we do. Our time is literally our the greatest resource. Right. That's right. So how can someone quantify or qualify how much my time and my talent is worth? I mean, it's, it, it, yeah. it's absurd to think that some other person can put a number in the book and say, here is what your time is worth. So, well, you, you, you're, you're a very successful book artist. Uh, let's say that I just graduated from school. How would someone be able to say that your time is equal to my time in pay? That would be ridiculous, right? Your name alone on a book has an audience. I just graduated from school yesterday. No one knows who I am. How could someone say, well, their time, both time, both persons time is worth $25 an hour. Right, exactly. And I would argue the same thing for the plumber, actually. I mean, I, I, for those who got offended about the plumber analogy, I personally, I think that a plumber should be able to charge whatever they want. And it's if ridiculous. you don't like the price, then you don't hire them. You That's know? ridiculous. That's ridiculous. <laughs> I think there should be caps. I think, I think there should be a salary cap. Or all, hey, hey, now I'm arguing against you, Will. There should be a salary cap on plumbers. They shouldn't be able to make more than this amount per year. Those guys right. were ripping people off for hundreds of years. All right, I'm done. Go ahead. <laughs> well, and I understand. I understand the whole union thing. Um, when you have a union, you've got to follow rules and things like that. But in in general, for me, I like open free markets because I think that um, you, as a consumer, uh, should educate yourself, and you should basically say, you know, call up three plumbers and and get a price, you know. Um, and, and that's really, and, and a plumber really couldn't make a living charging $500 for a $250 job. Well, the problem is they actually could listen, check this out. Let's yep, say you well, have, there are high, high end plumbers, right? If you have, if you have, let's say you live in a small town and there are three plumbers and there's no, 
quote unquote regulated fee, right? Based mm -hmm. on other small towns and based on, they could charge you $1,500 for a $20 job because they're all charging $1,500. That's true. They could collude. That, that becomes the problem. And you deal with this in big sports. This is why, you know, they stop that. I think, I think in that case, the union does kind of keep a generic specific price point and say, hey, we're going to stay in this area. This is about how much it should cost. So yeah. even if it's high, it's not astronomical because there's some type of control. So in this case, once again, it's measurable. Yeah. What a plumber does is measurable. We're not talking about uh, an architect. An architect, if, if you said that a designer of a house isn't measurable, uh, I would agree with that because it depends on how beautiful the house is and what they do. But if you're getting cookie cutter houses, guess what? They put a price on those cookie cutter houses and every house on that block that's designed the same way costs about the exact same amount of money. We right. don't just go, oh, you pick the pirate price and you sell it for whatever you want. If every house in the neighborhood is 200000 and you're selling yours for 600000 and it's the exact same house, that doesn't work out. So that's mm -hmm. measurable. Yeah. Art isn't measurable. Or music even. You know, write of a song. How do you measure that based on? Yeah. 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 So anyway. Yeah. All right. So I think we've hit that one. Now I want to move to, there's two more things. One is turning down work and then one's, uh, saying no to free design, which is something that sparked my attention from what you posted today on Facebook. So I want to have that discussion too, but let's, let's talk about first turning down work. Um, and I wanted to make the case that there's, that there are, let's see, how do I say this? Um, I think people take the easy way out when they turn down work and by that, and, and I want to get your opinion on this because we haven't talked about this. Um, I think that when someone turns down work, I wrote down some ideas here on why people might turn down work. For instance, one, you might be too busy Two, you might be going on a trip and you just physically can't do it because, you know, the time doesn't work out in your schedule. Uh, three, uh, it's not the right kind of work and you're not, you, you don't feel like you're good at it. It's not so, like we talked about in the beginning, you would probably take it anyway. Some people would say, I don't, that's not me. I can't do that. And I've, I've actually turned down some stuff that I really felt like they wanted really academic, uh, figures. And I just felt like, look, I'm more stylized. I'm going to turn this down. The third or the fourth one is, um, the deadline's too short. You just can't get it done in the time, even though you're not busy, you just can't, you don't feel like you could actually make the deadline. Um, another one is you don't like the subject matter. And so maybe out of principle, or maybe it's just something that you just don't like. Um, you turn it down, but the big one that, that, that people don't turn or that turn down work for is it's just not enough money. Right. Well, what I find is that when people turn down work, they don't say that they don't say that it's not, it's the money. A lot of times they'll pick, they'll use an easier one. Like oh, I'm too busy. Why? Because it's easier to just say, oh, I'm, I can't do it. I'm too busy. Mm -hmm. Well, and, but the, my, my, uh, the challenge I want to make to other illustrators, and I want to get your take on this, is that I think we do everyone a, a service, all of us, we do ourselves a service if we don't want to do it for any reason, right? Now, this could be, this could be considered unscrupulous, I guess, because what I, my thing is either charge three or four times what you normally would charge so that they'll say no, and then you're bumping the price up so that they realize that there are illustrators out there who want to do it for this, you know, um, or you end up getting the job, which has happened to me a few times, right? Where I've, I've asked for three or four times what I thought they could even be willing to pay, and they've said yes. But um, I want to get your take on that because I feel like, and the reason for that, let me let me just finish this thought up real quick, is that, and we've talked about this a little bit in the beginning before we started the podcast, is that illustration prices have remained flat since the beginning of basically of illustration in this country. Um, and we talked about Norman Rockwell getting $3,000 to do a Saturday evening post cover in the 1940s. Uh, back when house prices were about eight or $9,000. Imagine that getting three thousand dollars. That's like a third of the average home price For today. If the average home price is two hundred grand today. That's like getting seventy thousand dollars to do one illustration today in today's money. 
Well, okay, so you brought up a, you brought up a couple of good points. Let me talk about the one where you created a utopian society of artists who raised the <laughs> price up for other artists. Like, yeah, it sounds great, but that's not going to happen. Now, here's why it won't happen. The, the the reason why people take the easy way out is because, yeah, today that's not enough money for me, but what if my reservoir dries up? That's a good point. And I need you to come back. And that that, you know, that 7,000 that was ridiculous today is bread and honey for me tomorrow. That's so I'm going to say, uh, hypothetically speaking, not saying that I would say it, but I'm going to say, hey, man, I can't do it. I'm too busy, but thank you for the offer. Hope, And you'll see this. Hopefully we can work together in the future, yeah. meaning come back in a couple of months. I may take that. Right. Yeah. So, I, you know, as a freelance artist, is it's kind of hard to 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 carve it out in cement like the Ten Commandments. Here's my price point and I'm not moving because what will happen if you're not in demand. A lot of times they go to other people and they don't come back to you and they'll say that guy gave me an outrageous price that I couldn't possibly afford. Yeah. So, and, and and that's why an artist would simply, and I'm just answering a question. I'm not saying that's what I would do, but that's no, no, why. No, no, you're right. But I, and I have done both and, but I hadn't mm -hmm. thought about that. So that was mm -hmm. really good. Mm -hmm. um, that, that's why I'm here, Will Terry. No, I know. That's why, because I was thinking there's so much nuance to this conversation. I don't want to do it alone. That's why I called you. Mm -hmm. um, and I've, I have done both where uh, with some of them, I'm like, and I, and that's another really good point to bring up that I didn't have written down is, be very gracious if, if this is a job that you truly can't take at this time, you know, do everything to let them know because the the client has, you know, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of artists at their fingertips that they can ask the next time. Right. That's and so right. you yeah. have to give them every reason to come back. Like, you have no idea how much I really want to do this job, but I just can't right now. Will you please call me again in the future? Yeah. And yeah. at yeah. that point, I would not uh, argue the price. If I really couldn't take it because of scheduling, I wouldn't throw out a price. I guess what I'm talking about more is this is a client that you really just don't want to do the job for maybe there's two or three reasons or something, and you're just not going to do it, you know. But you want them to understand that illustrators get paid more. You're still not buying it, but I'm still trying to sell it. And, and I hear you. And, you know, it goes back to the term I use, that utopian artistic society. It'll never happen. <laughs> you know, and, and, and when you're, you're dealing with, right. when you're you're dealing with right. someone that you don't want to deal with, the last thing you're worried about is saying, oh, I'm going to pay it forward to some other artists. You're pretty much saying, yeah, listen, you go about it. You do, do whatever you got to do. I'm out of this one. Good luck. Say la vie and move on, right? <laughs> I mean, that's the reality. That's what really happens when we're dealing with people we don't want to deal with. Right. Uh, and so I would assume most artists do that. And I would say, yeah, man, look, you know, <laughs> if you can't work it out, just let them go figure it out on their own. So I just don't think it's reasonable or plausible to think that other artists would suggest prices in order to pass it on. It sounds great. Okay. But then let me argue this back. Cause that's, okay. you, 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 you've made a really solid point there. And what about this though? Um, it's somebody that offers you, I'm going to pretend to be your client and uh, I'm not your client. I mean, I'm somebody asking for you to do some work mm -hmm. and I offer you this ridiculously low amount. And do you feel like you want to let them know what other illustrators often get? Like the rain, you know, just, so, just like FYI, like, and sometimes they'll ask, you know? Yeah. So if that happens now, when that happens, when someone quote unquote insults me, with a price that's so <laughs> ridiculous. Now I handle that completely differently. And I would say, this is the rate that I would normally charge. Mm -hmm. And they'll say, well, I think that's too much. Can you do it for this amount? My response, and this had to do with the post is, I gave you my right, my rate. So the answer is no. Right. Like I, I make it very clear, like this is ridiculous. I'm not gonna even entertain this conversation. And oh, by the way, you're insulting me. Right. And you could just simply do that by being very curt, short and to the point. If they don't get it, you didn't want to work with them anyway, neither with the next artist, right? Now, is this someone that asked you for, I want to make sure that we're we're talking about the same thing, but is right. this someone who asked you, did they throw out the first price or did you? Both both ways, where they'll throw out the price. It, and, and if they throw out the price first, 
of course, I take that into consideration. They don't really understand. And so I try to say, well, you know, that's really low. This is normally what I would charge in this situation. Give them a ballpark. If they ask me and I give them a price and then they counter me with something insulting, I have to be very curt, quick and to the point. You're wasting my time and yours. And oh, by the way, it is a waste of time to go back and forth via email or with phone calls with clients who are not interested in paying you. Right. Right. They're interested in here. Here we go. Let, let me give you some of the things. This will be great for your portfolio. It'll be good exposure. Um, <laughs> well, this when the project takes take off down that other road. Now, I, I'm just saying this is this is those conversations. This is what you see. Oh, you'll get to pay later. I've never had a client come back to me. Right. I've been don't. doing this for 18 years. I've never right. had a client come back and say, hey, man, really love what you did. I'm making tons of money. Let me give you a huge bonus. I have no I take that back. I've had three people come back and give me money. But overall, it doesn't happen. You know, right. it doesn't happen if they're successful. Well, in the, in the, book, one, the, the, the line of. Well, I've got a lot of work. If you'll if you'll take one for the team, that's you know, yeah. what's funny is you know they told me about that when I was in school, and so the first time I heard it, I couldn't help but start to laugh, you know, because I'm like, this is what they told me I was going to hear uh, 25 yeah. years ago, and yeah. um, is it still happens and people still use that, and uh, I've still get that from time to time. It's 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 really funny, and uh, but. Okay, so that's interesting. So I thought you were going to agree with me on that, but then you you didn't, and so I it, didn't it agree with you, Will Terry. I caught no, you off guard. Good. I like boom. that. Boom, boom. I've always felt like I could help, but again, it's funny because I don't believe in utopian societies. So maybe this is me growing up on camera right here, you know, and actually becoming more in line. I'm I'm not that. I guess what it is is I feel like. I want them to go away. I don't want to, them to go away insulted. I want them to go. There are artists out there who actually get paid good money. And maybe they will be willing to pay the next guy a little bit more. Maybe they'll have to, if enough people turn them down, you know, maybe they'll go, well, I'm just not offering enough money. But here's the problem. Here's the problem with what you're thinking. Eventually, somebody will take the price that they're asking. Right. So I can I can lecture them or give them a cue on as to what the standard is in my head. By the way, it's my standard based on my my beliefs, what we talked about earlier. This isn't a, a universal truth, because if they say, well, I want you to do this entire book for two hundred dollars. Are you insane? Like, you know, like what do you know? Right. <laughs> but guess what? They're going to find somebody to probably do it for two hundred dollars. Now, will that person be very good? No. no. Is a book going to turn over? Probably not. Right. But they don't often even care about that. Right. They don't, they, as a matter of fact, not only do they not care, they don't often understand the difference between poor art and very good, good art. Point. That's a really good point too. So why, why would I spend time trying to educate them um, as to my understanding of art or my years of understanding right. of art? You when know, they're not actually a smart, you know, and now that I think about this, the, a person who is, has a decent amount of intelligence as a client is going to know they didn't offer you enough because most people, if you, if you offer them enough money, even if they're busy, they're going to figure out a way to do it. Right. That's right. So <laughs> that's, that's true. So yeah. Maybe I'm answering my own question basically with that. Um, any excuse you give is going to send the signal that something about the job wasn't attractive enough. Well, let me throw whipped cream on the cake. Uh, you could say no, and then they can go to Fiverr. Right. <laughs> right. Like so. So no matter what you said, no matter what the message was you, you, you tried to send, no matter what you try, how you tried to educate them, when they get done reading your email and they go to Fiverr and some guy's doing it for like seventeen dollars. What did you teach them in the first? Place, right. Really? Right. And, and oh, by the way, they're not concerned. Like we're lovers of art. We love beautiful art. We, this is our passion. This is what we want to do. We want to get better at it. And, and even like if you work for a larger company, they feel the same way. Right. You work for yeah. Disney, DreamWorks. They appreciate art. They know the value of art and they understand clients who do. But the people you're often dealing with don't and right. they don't care. They just want something to sell. They just want something to put on a shelf. They, you know, you know how many bad books are out there? Yeah. Well, <laughs> well, come on. Are you kidding me? It's everywhere. Do you think those people care? No, they have something to push. They can go to the convention and put it on the table and people buy it. And that's what they care about. Yeah. So I don't really, I'm not really interested in 
educating people uh, in that manner as far as pricing goes. It's a waste of time, really. Yeah, that's a good point. All right, before we get to say no to free design, because I want to make sure we hit that, another question that I wanted to kind of kick around was... Um, is the earth flat? <laughs> yeah. I mean, <laughs> have you figured that out yet? <laughs> Don't get me started, Will Terry. <laughs> No, um, it was, and I didn't write this one down and I'm starting to draw a blank right now, but it was, let's see, um, on offering money, it was a, if a client, oh, I know what it was. Um, so if a client, uh, offers you money, should you ask for more? Is it customary to ask for more? Um, you know, so basically I'll throw out a scenario. I, you know, I want you to, uh, I'm, I'm the client and I, I want you to illustrate a book and I say, I've got. $10,000 in my budget. Now, whether or not I'm just asking, cause I already know what my answer is, but I want to know, I want you to get it wrong <laughs> so I can get it right. <laughs> okay. Okay. So here, here's the deal. If someone says I got $10,000 to do a book, this is what's in my budget. <clears throat> the two ways you can handle that the smart way and the stupid way. <laughs> <laughs> so if you're making $500 to do a book, you shut up and you take the 10,000. <laughs> because you know you've been telling everybody else you're worth five hundred dollars, right? Yeah. This person is saying I'll give you ten thousand dollars. Why would you say give me fifteen thousand dollars? That doesn't make any sense. So it's it's too risky of a game to play. Uh, and if you say, well, I'll do it for eleven thousand dollars, right? Let's say mm -hmm. you want to play the game, and they say, never mind, I'll move on. You just lost more than I don't know ten times what you would normally make. That's true. Right? For what? Because you wanted to risk and be greedy. If you normally charge $500 for a book, like let's say in a realm of $1,000 for a book, and they say, mm -hmm. we'll give you $10,000 for a book, why would you push it? Now. All right. Now here's where I'm going to come back on you on this one. Wait, wait. Before you come back, I got to give <laughs> I got to give the smart way too. Yeah, I gave the smartest way. <laughs> okay. So now it's $10,000, but you normally charge $12,000 for a book. Yeah. Then you say, and then I appreciate the offer. I want to do the book for you. I think we can work together, but you got to at least come to 12. I can do it for 12, right? He's like, I can do it for 12. Now you're getting what you normally get. You want the job, you need the job. Then you take the risk because if you take it at 10, you end up losing money and time anyway. So you were, the job was going to be a no-go or it was going to hurt you anyway. So now it's worth taking a risk. That's the smart way. Well, let me kick you another scenario. Let's go. Okay. So- from my, my experience, what I've found is that pub now, now this isn't so I guess we need to decide who is offering the the job here because I think an individual uh because there's a lot of jobs out there that people will um hire someone and they'll do an indie book, an indie project on their own. And then there's publisher projects, and then there's like there's small, medium, and large publishers. So I would say that on the, the medium and probably even some of the small, but from the medium to the large publishers, they're used to, they're, it's customary for people to ask for more money. They don't always give it, but it's, it's, it's almost expected. And so I actually think even though asking for more from what you think is a gift horse, because if it's more than, like if it's your first book, let's say, or if it's more than you've ever gotten before, um, like for instance, one time I was offered $20,000 to do a book and it was the most that I've ever been paid to do one book. And I've never gotten that. Since. Look at Will Terry, big no, time no, in the art one, community. No, that was one go ahead, time. Will, go ahead. That we'll was one talking. time. And I didn't ask for more, you know, because like you said, you know, I was used to, to getting less and, and I didn't ask for more. I, but, and this is where, you know, I mean, Okay, this is my, where where people might say, "Well, Will, you're you know you're a capitalist pig for wanting more than, I mean, like you're getting more. Why do you need even more?" We all know that money. I like to well, I like to substitute money for life. Without money, you can't live, right? So you can worship money, and you can have your priorities completely out of whack on you know materialistic things, and and that that's a whole other subject. But the way I look at it is it's hard enough to make a, a living as an illustrator, as an artist. You don't have any guarantees that you're going to get work tomorrow or the next day. When you have a job, you for the duration of that job, you have a guarantee that every 
two weeks or every month, you're going to get that paycheck. Mm -hmm. And it's going to come in whether you worked hard or not that month. You know, sometimes you slack off at work, right? And so, well, uh, you, you make a good point. I like the point you just brought up. But I think in this, we're looking at it from two different perspectives. Me being, you know, me in the last couple of years switching from video games to children's book illustration. My perspective is I'm younger and I'm newer to the market. So I got to go for a lot of crap that you wouldn't have to go for. So my answer is going to be based on that. Now, in 10 years, if I've made 30 books and, you know, I'm deep in the industry, my answer is going to completely change. Yeah, I'm, I, I want F you money. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, like I'm going to say you offer me 20,000, double that and you got a deal because I can afford to do that. You, you know, if you walk away, if you're offended or whatever, you, it doesn't matter. I got other clients to come in. But to a younger, newer artist, and you're making 500 a book, let me just explain. I don't make I, that. I would punch somebody in the mouth if they offer me $500 for a book, <laughs> just so you know. Um, but I already knew that. Yeah. If, if, that's for the people out there who are like, oh, this guy will do a book for $500. <laughs> Ridiculous. I wouldn't do your mom for five. Anyway, so, <laughs> so uh, I, you know, it, it depends on where you are, what your answer is going to be. If you're making $500 a book and someone says, hey, will you do it for $20,000? I don't understand. What, why risk it? Why risk the, the, the opportunity going away to say, well, give me 25000 Well, here's how I would do it now. And that, that's why we probably should talk about this too. Um, now, this is where you're going to see me being a phony a little bit, right? Uh -oh. So be prepared. Don't get freaked out at all, okay? <clears throat> <laughs> Let's just crack these fingers. Here. Let's get to work, Will Terry. Okay, I might <clears throat> actually stretch the truth a little bit. Okay. Like, and I've talked about this before. When someone asks, when a client asks, what's your schedule like? Are you busy? The worst thing you can do is say, I'm wide open. I've been, I've been twiddling my fingers here waiting for you to call. Uh, and now that you have, you know, that, well, it would come in the form of an email, but now that you've emailed me, it's like the heavens have parted <laughs> and you know what I mean? And so, uh, so yeah. I, my suggestion is to always, you're always busy. Well, that's just, you're stretching the truth, right? But perception is reality. It's the same thing if you're at a yard sale. Uh, you like to use this example. Someone, you know, there's a base old baseball mitt there. And you're thinking, wow, 10 bucks? That's a really good deal on that uh, baseball mitt or softball mitt. And uh, you're thinking about buying it, but you don't. And then someone else picks it up. Did the value just go up? Now someone else has got it in their hands and you really wanted it. I would say yes. Yeah. yeah. So the so the value has just gone up. And so if you're busy, your value goes up because mm -hmm. it's like, well, I'm busy. Mm -hmm. uh, and so where I'm going with that is that on the on figuring out, you know, whether you're gonna ask for more money or not, if you say if 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 it's standard in the in the professional industry to ask for a little bit more, do you look weird not asking? For, do you look more like a novice not asking for more? And and and, and you're not saying, and, and let me say this, you're not saying I have to have this much. You're saying, you know, I, it would really be nice if I could get 2,100 or 2,200, um, you know, and then they'll, and from my experience, they will come back and go, well, this is a hard, fast budget. That's that's all we have. Or a lot of times they'll also they'll say, yeah, sure, we can do that. So then, here, the answer to the question is then this. <clears throat> it's how you respond to it. Yeah. It's how you respond. If you if it's an open ended question saying, can we negotiate this price? I think that's legit. But if it's this is what I need, you may end the relationship. You may end the conversation. But yeah. once again, well, you know, look, the reality is in a market that we have. <clears throat> In the market that we have, if you're charging five hundred dollars a book, is it worth the risk to challenge twenty thousand dollars or ten thousand? Is it worth the risk to me? Now I'm a capitalist. You, well, listen, hey, every <laughs> single, but but look, I'm also when it comes to gambling, I'm going to go with the sure thing. Yeah, and I, I, I don't know that. if the risk uh, is worth the reward because you could turn the person off and they go. Yeah, I did some research on you and I talked to the author you worked with last and they said they paid you 500. I loved your work so much. I offered you 20,000. You then told me you wanted me to pay 25. I think you think I'm a sucker. 
Therefore, I don't want to deal with you anymore. <laughs> I hear you. I think this one is a good one to not really answer. It's it's more right. You know, it's it's more uh, what you feel comfortable with. And if and and I have to admit, there are definitely a lot of jobs where I never asked for more because I I felt like I don't want to jinx this. Later on, I realized, gosh, in talking to other people, it's like, oh, they paid you this much more. Oh, they paid. How come? Well, because I asked for more. It's you know what I mean. So it's a for for some for some uh, industries and and for some publishers, I think it's standard op operating procedure. But again, I've been I've been turned down, and then you kind of feel like, yeah. But here's oh, the well. problem. It, it, you're right, but here's the problem with thinking like that. When you start measuring your needs to what somebody else has or their wants, you automatically come up wanting and lacking. For me to say, well, Will Terry is making this much, and that's what I should ask for, and I'm only a, I'm new to the industry, I don't have much experience, is suicide. So I have to measure based on my world and based on my reality. Yeah, somebody else may be getting a certain amount of money. That's cool, I, but I, it, I, to me, I think it's dangerous when we start comparing what someone else would have made in a situation versus what we need or we should make in a situation Point taken and i agree with that too and I, I i don't think that all i'm saying is that it's because a lot of people ask for more they're not freaked out by it that's all i'm saying right now, and, and that's true that's true i think the negotiation if you think it should be there should be there but greed may sometimes cost you a client absolutely. so it's really based on an artist based on a relationship and ultimately how you address it i think if someone's reading this watching this listening I think it's how you address the client. Uh, if it's an open-ended question saying, can we negotiate this rate? I would be more comfortable with this. And it's an open-ended thing where they don't feel like you're putting them in a box and saying, you have to pay me this amount. I think that works. But if you say, well, you offer me 20,000, I want 22,000. Yeah. That may be the end. That may be the last email you receive. It and if you're in a position to do that, then do it. Yeah. You know, Will, me, we might have clients, you know, emails every other day saying, hey, can you do this? So, and I'm not interested in the book as much. I don't think it's a good story. I don't think you'll follow through and put the books on the shelf. <laughs> uh, I'm going to shoot for 24, right? That's okay. It's a gamble worth taking, but big time company comes, tons of books out, tons of exposure, three times, 10 times more than what you make. Why? And I, and let me, let me agree with you and say that if I, was in a position where I really needed the money because I've been there many times and it was a really good paying job. I, I probably would not ask for more. Yeah. Well, and we've been in both. I've been in that situation. Right. You're like, you know what? I need to buy a turkey for Thanksgiving. <laughs> so <laughs> uh, can you forward me the first payment? We can get to work. I mean, right. that's the reality. It's all based on where you are, what your needs are. But if you have clients of the yin yang, you can say whatever you want to say. Yeah whatever you want to say. So I think we agree. I think we're saying the same thing just in yeah. different tones, right? Yep. Okay. Last say no to free design. <laughs> now, you know, I made a video I do. about this very thing and I want to get your take on it. Cause I saw you post that today and I've seen, you know, and this is, I see a lot of people talk about this, Steven Silver, Chris Oatley recently. Um, and it seems like the consensus among artists is, is to go against my natural feelings on this. Which are which are tell say what your natural feelings are. Okay, so we don't so have to go my, over So I'll make video. my point first and then you can tear it down. <laughs> and but again, I think we're gonna end up agreeing like we did. I think we're gonna end up being on the same place and it's gonna be boring because what that means is you come from being wrong to being right. Yes. <laughs> yes, Will Terry. Yes. You'll bring me back to sanity, right? So my so my feeling on this is that it's it's too nuanced to to make that absolute to say no. I think you should say maybe to free design. That's where I would modify it. I think you should probably let's say in fact let's say I think you should say no 70 to 80% of the time and maybe 10 to 20% of the time. Well Terry that's the smartest thing you've said in the last 24 hours. <laughs> okay. <laughs> No, look, look, you, you're right though. So let's let's say, let me give you some examples. I, I'm a, I'm a, yeah, I like to visualize a situation, right? Yeah. So let's say a guy like Will Terry comes and said, Tyrus, I want you to work on this project with me. 
Um, and it's going to take us about six months. I uh, can't pay you up front. But I think in the end, it'll be worth it. Then I go and look and see what you've done. I like your style. I like the way you work. I see that you're successful with the school, your, your Kickstarter. You have a history of success and following through, right? Then it's worth it for me to work with you and say, look, mm -hmm. trust this guy. I think he's going to follow through. I think the project will be successful. It's a great idea. I'm on board with the idea. Why not? That, to me, makes sense. So you say yes to free work then. But Auntie Susie has a friend who works with her at work, <laughs> who has a cousin who lives in her garage. Right. He has a brand new idea. And he says to you, hey, I want you to draw up my new weight machine. And I want it in 3D and I want the lights on it. I want to render it out. I want a little animation of creatures running around it. And it's going to take you about four months worth of free work. And I want you to do it. And it's good exposure for you. Then you say no. You say no, right? You, so you do have to look at the situation and say, who am I dealing with? Um, what is it worth? And now here's the more important thing. Who are you? So if right. I graduated last month, I don't have anything, you know, legit on my portfolio. I don't have any, any, any old projects to brag about. I don't have anything. Then yeah, you might have to take some free work. Uh, but once you've established that and you've gotten that first job, you got a pretty solid portfolio, pretty solid history. You have somewhat of a name. Why would you continue to do free work? with the idea of maybe if this person is successful, they might pay me. That's crazy. And we've exactly. all done it as artists. We've all done it as artists. We've taken some crazy project that didn't lead to anything and it ends up being time wasted. And so to a younger artist, I would say, you just be very careful. Your time is your money. It is your career. I, I totally agree. And I would, the only reason that I'm talking about this is because a lot of these, and I'm showing like this archive of my crappy work from, from most of this is from, from quite a few years ago. A lot of this, and I'm actually looking for a few, some of this is actually schoolwork too, but um, there's some, there's quite a few images in here that if I went back and, and told the story on each one, which we don't definitely don't have time for now. Um, there's at least, you know, two dozen, stories that i could give and i can't see the ones that i'm looking for so i'm just going to stop but um there's at least two to, two dozen different stories i could tell of where i did a, a project for either free or for 100 bucks or for 200 bucks that was well below what i would normally what i would have to charge to make a living but because of the opportunity i took it and it led to and then i can show you the high paying job that I got from having that in my portfolio. And that's the problem that I have with the absolute say no. The, the other problem that I have with it is when, when, um, you know, peer pressure is a, a strong thing, right? And so we have a lot of artists that are trying to break in. If they feel they're going to be judged because they said, Hey, look at this. Maybe they, you know, they did do a job for free or for, you know, 50 bucks or a hundred bucks or something. And then they, now they're embarrassed and they don't want to show it. They're afraid that the story's going to get out that, you know, their friends are going to shame them for artist shaming, you know, for, <laughs> for, <laughs> <laughs> for taking a job for free. Well, someone like Chris Oatley or someone like Steven Silver, you know, or, or some other big name out there, they can afford to say no to a lot more than the guy that's coming up. And that's the problem that I have on face value. Now, do I think that you should say no to, to someone that's asking you for free work most of the time? Absolutely. But I have a problem with the never. absolute never, never yeah. because of the, I've got so many stories that where, I've, where it made my career by doing these, these gamble. Did I lose? Did I, did I do work where someone promised me more work and it never came? Absolutely. Did I do work where it ended at the hundred dollars or the free? Yes. I have so many failures on that account, but I'm still alive. I'm still breathing. I've still got a shirt, you know, and roof. <laughs> a nice orange prison jump shoots. Yeah, there you go. But, yeah. but no, so, but here's the deal. I, we're on the same page as this. We agree on this, but I think it's where you are in your career that determines that answer. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And at some point, Will Terry, if someone emails you and say, hey, uh, I don't have any money, but I want you to work for free. 
your answer is probably going to be no, but there's a lot of things that go into it. One, if this idea is so great and you believe in it so much, why don't you have any money for it? Yeah. Yeah. If it's so great, why aren't you, you want me to sacrifice my time, my energy, my artistic ability, but you don't want to sacrifice anything. You don't want to cut the lunches out. You don't want to cut the dinners out. You don't want to cut your groceries in half. You don't want to pay your bills late, but you want me to pay my bills late. You know, they, at, at some point you have to say, why am I the one who's being asked to risk everything? Right. And, and, and that's so, where 90% of the time or 80% of the time it is there, someone no, looking there. to get over on an artist and, and they, you know, and they think, and you, you know, this as well as I do, <laughs> A lot of people think that we just would we would draw their assignment for them for fun. Like this is fun for us. Like we just right. whip it out. Like there's no emotional labor. There's no struggle. No thought to there's it. No, no thought or anything. Form, yeah. There's nothing else we'd rather be doing except working on their stupid project for free. So I get it. I get the frustration. Mm -hmm. I get it when someone asks that has means and you know they do. Because mm -hmm. uh, I've had that happen where someone I know is very well off. And they're like, hey, can you work on this thing? And I, one thing I learned early on is, and this is this is a piece of advice for everybody. I know uh, what you're about to say, and I love it. Do you really? Is it is it rich people are rich for a reason? No, but oh the, well. But that's, hey, I just threw a piece of advice out there. They, they don't pay. <laughs> they're rich for a reason because they don't like to give money away. But go that's ahead, true, Will Terry. That's true too. No, what I was going to say is that when someone wants to start a business or a, or a project or something. So in their mind, they get all gung ho about it because I've had this. I've I've been lured in when I was in my twenties, and even embarrassingly, in my early thirties, I I you know I would vow this is never going to happen to me again. And then all of a sudden, I walked into another one of these <laughs> these you know these projects where I'm helping someone out, and then I'm dreading it. And I'll and what it is is they get this idea, they get all excited about it, and the first thing they can think of to do is to call us. It's like they haven't done anything on this project. Mm -hmm. They haven't thought of anything. They haven't gotten funding together. They they haven't done anything. But they can get us working because sometimes we're stupid enough to just start working on it, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So here we are doing their thing. And then have you ever done one where the, the project never goes through? They never print it or they never? Absolutely. Yeah, and they never do anything. And that, the reason for that is because they, were, they, they weren't ready for the art. <laughs> and they and and they aren't. It was an idea to them, and you did all the work, so they aren't invested in it. That's right. As much as you invested. are, so right. they don't even follow through. You did all the work. All they did right. was have. I got an idea, and right. so they don't care if it follows through. And you're meanwhile like, hey man, did you put that book out, or well, right. you know what happened? Because you're looking for the exposure, and they don't care. Right. But two things I want. Two points I want to bring up. No, yeah. To, to the people, <clears throat> to the people who are thinking about doing it. You, you're new out of school. You you know starting a new career, whatever. Um, one is. Ask for ownership and whatever it is you're doing. So if they're saying, well, we, I can't pay you, blah, blah, blah. Okay, then give me ownership, partial ownership where I can sell it. Like if you do a book for someone and you say, well, give me partial ownership where I can sell as many copies as I like and reap the reward from it. That could be mm -hmm. my payment. If they say no, you completely understand this person has every intention of ripping you off. Right. Right? Because it doesn't cost them any money to give you ownership to sell the idea that you create. That's the first thing. The next thing is <clears throat> most of the people who want work for very little or for free are the worst clients in the world. <laughs> the worst ever. They are the worst <laughs> clients in the world. The people who pay you freely and openly, they let you be creative. They trust you. They know you know what you're doing. And you don't have as much back and forth. It's yeah. really like, man, you're the artist. I hired you. I love your work. Let's go. The people who go, hey, can you do me a favor or can I get a half off? Oh, my gosh. Oh. Yeah. Oh, yeah, oh, it's a nightmare. Run, run. Here's a here's another here's another strategy that I learned to to uh, weed them out, to get them to go away, to get them to rethink, to go somewhere else, to find someone else. And and this is this is what I've used. I've used this a few times within the last five years with friends. Even you know friends of you know hey you know uh, they're on Facebook and they're like you know I've got this project, and this one guy who I'm really good friends with. Um, he had a project for, it was a marathon thing. He, he's a long distance marathon runner. He wanted a little logo thing for it. He said, okay, as, as a friend, he's like, and he, you know, and he, he's like, we, he manages this restaurant. So he's like, I'll hook you up with a bunch of food and you and your wife can come and stuff. And it, what it, I was going to do was going to take me probably an hour at the most, you know, but what I did was I said, 
okay, but I get to decide what your logo looks like and you don't get to decide anything. If I'm going to do it, yeah. I can only spend an hour, but you're going to get an hour of my expertise and you don't yeah. get to make any changes. Now you can decide not to use it, but I still get the, the food, right? And he, and he was totally fine with that. He was like, dude, if you're going to do it, I am totally down with that. <laughs> and I was surprised because I thought usually it weeds them out. They're like, they're, they're actually act offended, you know? Like, what are you talking about? I don't get to, you know, you don't get to make a decision. I'm doing this for free. So this is going in my portfolio and I'm going to own this, this project and you're not going to mess it up. Well, Terry, that is now the smartest thing you said in the last 24 <laughs> hours. You're constantly impressing me and the audience at the same time. I'm always a student in your class. You know what? Ready that to was learn. hard fought, baby. I mean, I put in, you know what I mean? I've got the scars. <laughs> I've got the scars there. You know, when you want to tear your life out because you've agreed to do this thing and it's just hanging. Oh, oh my gosh. Oh. No, it's just hanging over oh. your head. And every oh. time you, you're about to take that deep breath and go, I think I'm, you remember that you've got that thing you're supposed to do for that guy or that gal and you can't relax. You're not done. And I've, I have promised myself, the, my goal in life is to never let that happen anymore. So if I help someone else out, it's going to be on my terms, right? So it's going to be on based on you don't get to make changes. And it's worked like a charm. And usually they go, you know, well, maybe I'll look for someone else. It sounds like you're busy. Or or I, I've actually had somebody through email who was offended. Like, why would you think that you get to decide? <laughs> Why would you, you know, think that you get free artwork? Why would you think that you get free artwork? Imagine, that. imagine that. Yeah, I, I did that. I did something like that with this book that I'm working on now. So I go, the person said, look, this is all I have. It was about a quarter of what I would normally charge, but it was a desperation situation for her. I needed the cash immediately for me. I had to get that turkey. I told this is real. So I had, to, I had to get that turkey. So this money was coming in. I was like, oh, this will cover me for like four months just in case no more work came in, anything like that. So the deal was <clears throat> I get ownership of the book too. I can sell as many copies as I like, blah, 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 blah. But it's uh, you know, it could be a rocky road. If you get a if you get a difficult client and you you're not even getting paid the full amount or anything, it can consume your time and stop you from working on other projects. So you have to get something out. It's gotta be a it's gotta be a a, a one piece for your portfolio. It has to be something in it for you. You can't just do work and go, I hope it works out for me in the end. You have to be able to envision it, have a plan for it, and contract it. Yeah. Have it in writing. Because a portfolio, it, and that's a great thing to point out, because it, for me, if I get a portfolio piece, and I'm talking, when I, when I say portfolio piece, I mean like one out of 10, one out of 20 of my best pieces I've ever done in my life. It, that has value. Yeah, that's, absolutely. You know what I mean? That has value. And that's why I say that in the rare cases that I would be willing to do it for free. And if you're if you just tuned in, go back and watch what we said before, you know, because we we did talk about that in most cases free is not good. Um, but again, the the nuance to it is that there are times if you see, you know, because sometimes it, the other thing I wanted to say is you end up um you know, you're trying to come up with, and this is another video that I've got to make because it's on my schedule, but it, it, which is about like what to put in your portfolio. And people are constantly asking me, what do I put in my portfolio? How do you, how do I come up with ideas? How do I generate the, sometimes the free jobs actually have some super creative ideas. So that's one of the only exceptions where I would take one is if I go, oh, this could be a portfolio piece. And what I've done sometimes is I've done the free one. It's been for a client. They needed, they wanted changes. I begrudgingly did them, but I actually painted the other one for my portfolio. Then this is early on in my career. And I ended up getting a portfolio piece that ended up getting more work down the road. And so in the end, that's why I'm, again, you know, I'm not an advocate for free work. So don't, don't put me there. Well, Will Terry, he wants us to work for free. What do you say, Stephen Silver? No, and that's not what I'm saying. <laughs> well, I'm Terry saying, thinks we should live in tents. What yeah, do you exactly. think, Silver? No, I, I think that there are exceptions to that rule. But I think it's a pretty good rule. Just be careful of absolutes. Um, absolutes is, is limited thinking, right? 
Yeah. Myopic. Yeah. yeah. And there are very few absolutes in the real world. That's there right. are very few absolutes. And there's gray and there are changes. And what what what's real today may not be real tomorrow. If you're That's making right. sixty thousand every three months today, in six months you may be making ten thousand. So right. it changes, and so your rules have to be flexible depending on the situation. Absolutely. Perfect. That's a great note to end on. Thank you so much for being willing to do this. And uh, I'm so glad that I, I, that you agreed to do it because it wouldn't have been as good by myself. You really, you opened my mind up on some of these things. And so thank you. And I, I no, also thank you, Will Terry. Thank you. <laughs> I want to thank those of those that have tuned in. Um, and I wish I could figure out how they could chat to us um while we're doing this you probably know how to do that i do i'll show you after the show will terry okay because i want to do that for another another one because i feel like we're missing out on some good um input from people that are that you know like we're missing on some of these notes too some of the things that we didn't think about so well if you invite me back we can continue it and the people who listen they can ask me questions and tell me how i'm wrong about everything and then i'll tell <laughs> them how they're wrong about everything and we can have a good discussion <laughs> Sounds yeah. good. All right. Thank you, man. Cyber fist bump. All right. Cool. First time in history a black dude missed a fist bump. I'm punching at my screen like an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. By the way, did anybody notice how many cool black friends Will Terry has? He's like the reverse of Donald Sterling. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, definitely. All right, man. Peace out. Take care.